husband teaches. He, um, they just reported another one. So their whole admin team is out mm -hmm. uh, quarantine, except the principal. <laughs> yeah. Good evening. Evening. Uh, Where is this, Lisa? Oh, I was just talking with Tiffany. It's in Guilford. I was talking with Tiffany that our um, school board started their meeting last night at six o'clock. And then at 930, they finally voted that the kids would come back tomorrow. So today was a holiday. <laughs> um, but the thing at my school, so I'm quarantined because I go into a kindergarten classroom. Mm -hmm. So we have a kindergarten classroom quarantined, a pre-K classroom quarantined. I'm quarantined as an EC teacher. The other EC teachers quarantined because their son's in the kindergarten classroom. Our third EC teacher has put in a resignation because the kids are coming back and she's retiring. And we have a speech pathologist quarantined because she goes into the pre-K. So even if the kids come back to get their EC services, there's no EC staff there. <laughs> it's just a mess. <laughs> Yeah, it's not good. Um, I see Shanda's with us now. I hope she's doing well. I, one of my one of my former master's students, who's now in the EDCI program, she's AP at Lake Norman High School in Ireland County, Mooresville, Dooley. Um, I got a saw a prayer request for her a few minutes ago. She's got it. It's not doing well. So I think their uh, their administrative team is probably in quarantine now because she's been going to work. Um, so it's not good. Uh, one of my colleagues at Gardner Webb, um, in organizational leadership, his brother has it, um, and he's in Stanley County, and they can't get him to the big hospital in the neighboring county of Cabarrus because they don't have any beds. All their beds are full because that's, of course, a suburb of Charlotte. Um, and so his brother is not doing well. Um, uh, appears that he got it from, they did contract back to a workman came to his son's house and spread it to their family and they spread it to the grandchildren spread it to the grandfather before he could, before they knew. But my, my whole point is, is um, it's going crazy now. The infection rate has doubled, by the way. Uh, and so um, folks don't understand what exponential means, I'm afraid. Um, why we're making some of these decisions, we're just fatigued. They're not based on science or medicine. And, and this is part of what happens in political systems where you have the dumbest people in the county run for the school board, uh, usually ax grinders and, and people who have no business uh, even raising kids, much less being involved in decisions about kids. I would tell you how I feel about school board members, but I, I'm trying to hold back. Um, very few very few, unfortunately, school board members run for the right reasons anymore. It's now, school board membership is now seen as legitimate entry into political careers. And so we have all these partisans and ax grinders uh, that run um, rather than doing the right thing for, for students and for, for teachers. Uh, we already have a teacher shortage nationwide, and now we're gonna kill off what few we've got, um, but we don't seem to care. We think that we can just flag anybody down, stick them in the classroom. Um, you know, um, I, I'm just amazed at how we went from, boy, we really respect what teachers do to teachers are expendable uh, over the course of six months. And that's exactly, that's, that's been the arc of this is, boy, it's hard keeping your kids all day. I really respect what teachers do. Now we're to the point where uh, you know, their lives are expendable. I can't, I, I'm, I'm no longer willing to be inconvenienced. Uh, if it kills them, that's just the way it works. Should have picked a different profession. Uh, we've gone from that. And so, um, really tough times. Really tough times. 
Anybody have anything else they want to share this week? Shanda, I see you're back. I'm glad you're back with us tonight. I hope all is well. Hey, yes, it's a great day. I got my stitches out, so I'm Good super excited. Good for Thank you. you. I, was, I, I told Shanda last week, I emailed her, I felt bad right before when Dr. Laws and I and Steve and I were doing our weekly update right before class. I was, somehow it came up, I was telling him how on the first Friday in May in 2018, we were a uh, group, we were preparing for our Founders Day dinner in, in the community clubhouse here. My wife cut her thumb uh, at 15 till eight and I was able to get her to the local urgent care and they wouldn't see her and they sent us to the one down at Huntersville next to the hospital and they wouldn't see her there. And we had to stay in all night in the emergency room, um, $2,500 and 12 hours later, we got home the next morning at eight. So, uh, and we have insurance, so uh, go figure. But I, I was telling sharing that story with him and then and Shanda has to get stitches. So I hope yours turned out better than, than ours did all night in the emergency room. Uh, so we're glad to have you back. All right, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. Steve may join us later. He's involved in something else right now. So let me share my screen and we'll look at, the weekly schedule. We're on Wednesday, November the 11th. Um, this is case study two, superintendent's letter to the community. Next week we will do, we are normal two, our LB, LGBTQ. Uh, case study and then we'll do our inclusion case study on Wednesday November the 12th the 25th and so then we'll we will conclude please remember to put all of your your OMA and APSEL and your four previous evidences from your EDCI program in task stream uh, I've been very pleased with the work on the OMA I hope that you are learning uh, if you need more instruction on it, as I tell you every week, just let me know. I can do a one-off or I can do a session with you on the OMA, but everybody seems to be doing fine. But if you're not, please let me know. Uh, we know that you know how to do these things and follow directions or you wouldn't be here since uh, all of your ABD or doctors. So we, we assume that you will, will tell us if you need for, for us to, to do something differently with that. But I've been very pleased with the work so far. Um, how pressing it is right now in terms of uh, mosaic schedules where you have to do school within a school. Now that we're doing, you know, different different themes, AB day, some days kids here, some virtual mix. This it's all about scheduling, uh, and hopefully you're you're learning some of the functions of those schedules. But as Lisa pointed out. I don't know how we're going to provide those federal services if we don't, if our teachers are in quarantine. Uh, but those are issues, you know, federal law comes first. You've got to meet those. And so you got to figure out a way. Now, how our administrators are going to do that, I don't know. Uh, but they've got to, they've got to find a way to provide those services. Uh, because as when we do master schedule, remember, those federal law first, state law, local board policy, EVOS best practices, and then teacher input it goes that way always. And so we have to make sure that we take care of those programs. It goes that way with funding as well. We have to make sure we understand that those that, that funding works that way. And so that leads me into tonight. Uh, I can go ahead and close that. And we've got case study two. Uh, a letter to the community. Make sure you've read chapter two, resource allocation, financial planning and resource management. For school administrators, review the Leandro case from North Carolina on school funding. Is the superintendent's plan appropriate? Present both sides of the issues. Again, address legal and ethical concerns. Uh, uh, create as a team a short PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and then write your reflection. So here we go. All right. So what is the order that we're going in tonight? Just had it pulled up. Who's going first? Remind me, group two, is that right? Don't everybody start talk at once. 
Do I need to pull that document back up? We can go first if you want us to. We're group right. two. And that's wonderful, Yvonne. Thank okay. you. Let's see if this is Share my screen. Uh, Steve says he's having internet trouble, but he'll be here eventually. So, all right. So. Can you see my screen? You can. Great. Okay. Good. Perfect. Okay. So, um, for case study two, a uh, letter to the community. Uh, my group is Shanda, Yvonne, and myself. Bianca and we um, kind of provided an overview to this case study that the superintendent wrote a letter to inform parents and community members that the budget was going to be changed for the upcoming year. The student-based budgeting pilot would take place at four schools. The new budget will provide more equity by utilizing formulas to allocate funding to students identified as at risk and the next step would be at the school level where the principal would contact the stakeholders to provide information. Um, with this case, um, there, I'm oh, sorry, the, um, the example was given um, for us to kind of review um, an actual case that was in North Carolina, and so Shanda is going to give us a little bit of insight into that. Hey, so in Leandro versus the state of North Carolina, there were some school districts that got together, and and from if I understand it correctly, they said, "Look, uh, doing it with our um, income-based funding, this is not fair. We have." schools that are severely underfunded. We have children who are suffering because of this. And uh, there were some, I believe it says there were some of the lowest funded in the state. <clears throat> so they launched a, uh, they launched a lawsuit and took it all the way, of course, to the state of North Carolina. And next slide, please. And, the state has ruled that, or the court has ruled that there is, while there is a constitutional obligation to ensure that all children have access to basic education, um, they, they continue to agree with the uh, local based or the income based funding. So as a result, these counties are still some of the lowest funded counties in the state. <clears throat> For us in South Carolina, uh, thinking about equity, our minds always go back to that um, a documentary, I think, The Corridor of Shame, where we have some of the most horrendous conditions that children are being schooled in. Not only is their area and their community severely impoverished, but their schools reflect that. I know um, on the video, when I watched it, they were actually showing children who were sitting in old locker rooms in showers where sewage was bubbling up from the shower drains. And this was how these children were being educated. And it was consistently said, but look, that's constitutional. So we know in both North and South Carolina that equity is a huge issue. Um, Yvonne, when we were talking just as a group, Yvonne mentioned the issue of virtual schooling and students who don't have internet and students who don't have, um, or they don't go to school in a district that has provided them with some type of tablet or computer. And yet the courts continue to rule that while it's tragic, it's still constitutional. Okay, so the next thing that we did was we talked about what our course of action would be since the implication from the letter was that the principal would actually be notifying the community of the stakeholders of the schools that were involved in this new student based budget. And so we thought about what would be the best way to approach this. And so we felt that it would be really important to inform the community, but then also come up with a way that would really explain in a clear in a clear manner as to how the money was going to be allocated and to what extent it was going to promote equity. 
So we said the first thing that we would do as a principal would be to form a community, a committee, and most likely to have or use the school improvement team within the school to actually talk about how this would be dispersed. Um, we would definitely be making sure that we would compare the goals and needs of the school and align that the funding with those goals and needs of the school to, to meet those at-risk learners. Um, we said that we would definitely make sure that we had teacher voice and perspectives on the situation so that we were also getting their input so that there would be a full onboard consensus as to this is what we we're going to do so that everybody clearly understands to make it really transparent for the whole. Um, we also talked about allowing parents um, to provide their perspectives of how the funding would benefit the students and the school. And then we definitely identify the fact that the administrative perspective and logic would need to be addressed or identified and then talked about how we would compile a list of su suggestions based on how the funds would be allocated to again make that that whole change and pilot more transparent for everybody. Um, we discussed due process so substantive we talked about law and policy how it's going to be applied we talked about procedural talked about how the the actions that we had would reduce liability, making an informed decision for the foreseeable future. So we felt that, again, being more proactive, getting everything in line together beforehand, and making sure that everybody that was involved, all the stakeholders, had a say and understood how everything was going to be distributed, it would really be um, in our best interest to actually be as clear as possible with the whole community. Um, and then we definitely decided that it would be a good idea to emphasize and provide examples of successful re reallocation of funding based on this budget because they did describe or the superintendent in the letter said that there were schools across the country that had seen success with this budget process. So moving forward, um, our next, our next um, item on the agenda would be to arrange a parent meeting to disperse information. And so um, discussing the administration, the perspective and logic, um, talking about parents, talking to, to parents to hear their information and to get their questions again, to open up the communication, and then to discuss the policy and process and really emphasize the equity that was going to promote more success within the school for those students. And then um, again, we'd also create a time and space for parents who were unable to attend the meeting so that they would also have a voice as well. Okay, so for our ethical, ethical paradigms, um, Justice, we um, was stating and establishing the understanding that there is a policy, so there is budgeting, um, and that meeting with the parents and allowing them a time and space for understanding to explain mm -hmm. those policies were both um, examples of justice and the examples for care is that me yeah yes that's yeah. me loyalty and trust with teachers <laughs> i'm sorry parents and the community um concern and connection with hearing all concerns and offering a restorative alternative building a positive relationship with teachers and the parents in the community collaboration and shared decision making with teachers and attention and support for all involved hey, considering the um paradigm of critique <clears throat> we wanted to make it clear that there was always going to be a, a reevaluation policy um especially in a budgeting situation everything should be open and honest and also a chance to come back even at the end of a school year to come back and look at this and say okay this was this was what went well this is where we need to improve just reflect to practice as we should all be knowing and doing anyway um and also understanding <clears throat> that everything was specific to the district policy it always had to come back to the district policy and at the school level it always had to align with the school's mission and vision. Okay, and finally, um, in terms of the profession, uh, we really felt that it was important to emphasize, you know, or for us to emphasize, you know, being transparent in the situation and really talk about how um, the potential consequences of this could, could definitely help out 
the students as a whole. Um, we definitely talked about considering any potential legal consequences, especially when reflecting, reflecting on the Leandro case. Um, we felt that the way that we were actually setting everything up proactively, that we were actually, you know, considering democracy, equity, diversity, and trying to incorporate different perspectives. And then again, like the whole, the whole reasoning, the whole drive for this was really to ensure the best interests of the students, meeting their needs and making sure that that was a huge priority on our list. Okay. That was it. All right. Okay. All right. Very good. Very good presentation. All right. I'm going to walk you. you through some steps now. Uh -huh. All right. So what happened in North and South Carolina in the mid 1960s as a result of the Civil Rights Act of 1965? North Carolina and South Carolina in 1966 did what? Going back to that lesson we had on court cases. Desegregation? Well, we, we started well, desegregation not. of schools in 1960. Right. That is correct. As a result, although Brown versus the Board of Education said separate is not equal happened in 1954, right. we didn't start segregating I schools know. in North and South Carolina until 1966. That is correct. <clears throat> now, as a result of that desegregation, what did both North and South Carolina do in terms of state funding for building school buildings? They said, we're out. We're done. Um, that we will no longer fund school facilities in North and South Carolina. That that responsibility, that capital, that's buildings, that the, the responsibility for capital will be now thrust upon who? Who now has the responsibility to fund school buildings? The federal government? Nope. It was the community. Oh, the local? county? The local yeah. counties. Yeah, yeah. So North and South Carolina both have unempowered school boards. That means when they want to spend money, they have to go where to get it? Voters. Can't, the county commissioners. So when the, the superintendent starting in January, February, puts together the, the district budget for the year, he presents it or she presents it to the school board and they do their machinations and they come up with a final version of the district's school budget. Who do they give that to then? The county commissioners, because they are the funding authority for local school districts. School boards being unempowered mean they cannot levy taxes. They have to go, the school board has to go hat in hand with the superintendent's budget to the county commissioners to get them to fund it. <clears throat> and those same county commissioners have to fund all capital projects. So the state get, got out, both North and South Carolina got out of funding capital buildings, which is a big part of what it costs to, to, to have schools in the mid 60s. And the state said, we're going to give you per pupil money to run, operate schools, 85% of which is for teacher salaries. We're going to give you now about $8,000 per pupil. All right. And you are to do with that. But it's got to go to Leandro and that the lawsuit said, we're all getting $8,000, whether we're in Hope County or whether we're in, we're in Mecklenburg or Guilford County, we're all getting $8,000. Now, local boards of education, because of local wealth, can get more money from their county commissioners in some county than others. The money that goes to the schools the county, from the counties comes from property tax and business mm -hmm. tax revenue. So every time you see one of these incentive packages for a business to come to your community and they give them tax breaks that comes straight off the bottom line for school 
business tax, property tax, homeowner property tax are what fund school at the local at the local level. Remember, we have state, we have federal, state, and local money. We're talking about local money now comes from the county commissioners. They raise that. They they are empowered to tax businesses and homeowners on property tax. Um, and so if, if, if you waive the local tax on businesses, that, that cuts down your money or if you don't have businesses. And so the Leandro lawsuit said, this is inherently unfair. This flat funding formula that you have, we want district power equalizing with a recapture provision. That's in your book. What that means is, all right, we're going to assume for a moment is, is anybody from one of those low wealth counties? Um, we're going to assume for the moment that Yvonne sent, we'll say that she's from Hope County. And the state gives her county $8,000 per pupil. And I'm from Mecklenburg County, and so they give us $8,000. Well, that seems like, isn't that fair? They both got the same. The problem is, in the end, it's not the same. Because the local can 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 decide to put more with that eight thousand dollar per pupil, and so what the lawsuit said is, these these low wealth counties can't put any money with that because they're they're burdened with trying to keep up with facilities. There's no capital money coming. They've got to spend all of their money locally just to try to keep the building open, the lights on, and and them heated and cool. We don't have extra money per pupil to give to get extra teachers or extra supplies in the building. We're spending all of our money in Hope County trying to keep the doors open. Mecklenburg not only can keep the doors open, they can add another $4,000 per pupil every year. So in the end, they spend $12,000 per pupil where we only spend eight. That's inherently unfair going back to the Constitution, equal protection under the law. So that was the basis of their lawsuit. Because the state got out of capital funding in the mid 60s, that all the local money in the low wealth districts was going just to, keep, to pay the power bill, to keep the buildings open. And that they could not add any additional funds to the actual schooling of children. Teachers, facilities, books, supplies, I mean, teachers, supplies, um, those kinds of things, um, the, the, the things inside of the building, they could not add any different to that. So what they wanted was this. They said to the state, we want you to give them $6,000. They'll add their four to it, and so their mm -hmm. students will have 10 rather than 12. Give us 10, add that two you took from charlotte to us so we went from six from from six from eight to ten and take two from them so they went down from 12 back down to 10 and we both get 10 that way and what did what was the ruling in leandro case no. they said no bueno absolutely not let me share that with you this was also on we had this one i, I included this document this is the bottom line on leandro this is from Duke Law School. All children in North Carolina have a fundamental state constitution to receive a sound basic education. We don't, we, you know, just the, the bare minimum is all that you get. And we're gonna give you that in, in, in that $8,000 a year. You have no right any more than, than what we give you. If your local district gives you more, that's fine. But that's the only right that you have is to that baseline that we give you. All right, now. And so, <clears throat> school districts nor counties have any constitutional right to equal funding uh, in terms of at the end. That they said it's okay that, that they, you, as, long as, as long as you get the baseline of eight, that Charlotte gives 12, that, that there's no, that's not illegal, that's not wrong. You have no right to the 12, you only have the right, the legal right to the eight, the basic that we give you. Now, and here's, here's of what is significance to our case tonight. 
of equal significance the Supreme Court rule of the state of North Carolina, not local districts, has the ultimate constitutional obligation to actively safeguard and successfully deliver every child's Leandro right. No exceptions, no excuses. So what that means is not only will the state not vary the level of money, can the local district do that? Can the local district vary the amount of money once they get the funds from wherever, can they then vary those funds on their own? That's a simple yes or no. 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 <laughs> that is correct. That would be no. So the question number two is, is the superintendent's plan legal? That would be no. Because what does what did Leandro say in their finding? Not only will the state not balance the money in the end, district power equalize, take two from the rich to give it to the poor, Robin Hood. The local can't do that either. So you cannot, you cannot do this. You cannot, if we differentiated state money, that $8,000 per pupil, what would happen? What would, what, what would be the big movement of money? What would that, what would that entail? Well, it would move teachers. How well would that go over if your child is at a school that's going to lose four teachers when somebody else's is going to gain? Would you be happy about that? That your child, instead of having 25 in their sixth grade class, is now going to have 45? Would you be happy about that? Of course you would not. Of course you would not. Um, and so, <clears throat> We, we've got to understand that we can't move federal money. That comes generally in, in salaries, CTE, exceptional children, Title I, um, English as second language, academically gifted. Most of that federal money comes for those programs, for those teachers, and for their equipment. That can't be manipulated. Leandro says you can't manipulate the state funds. You can't do district power equalizing with that. And so I get students who ask me all the time, but Dale, what if he's just talking about local budget? Aha, uh -huh. can, can he manipulate mo local money and give more to one school than the other? Can he do that? All right, that's, that's the next part of the discussion here. Somebody weigh in on that. We're, we're not going to touch federal money. We're not going to touch state money. We're only going to move local money. Can the superintendent do that? I think, I don't know, but I think yes, maybe. Yes, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm going off of what I see in my county. I'm from the poor end of my county. So we have buildings that are like 70 years old and then the west side has these brand new buildings. So, but I know that has a lot to do with fundraising and the PTO and there's just more money on that end of the county. So I, I don't feel like the superintendent like moving money down there, but that's just what it looks like. Mm -hmm. All right. So wrapped up in what Mal Mallory just said to us again, facilities, that's that's local. Um, that part of it is generally manipulated around bond, the, the bond money. Um, you know, bonds are not binding in terms of when you go out and, 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 and campaign for a bond that are in election time and you, you, you publish a list of what you're going to buy um, with that money if the voters pass it. it that is... You know, I won't bother to, to go through that long, short story long as I normally do. That's non-binding. And as soon as the bond is passed, what can what can happen? That money can be redirected any way that you want to uh, once that happens. Then the politics start. My wife just waved at me. She just went out the door to go pick up the, the groceries from the automated drive-in grocery business. We live in an affluent part of the world with, that has all these extra things. That's important in that she worked until she retired at the lab school at Davidson College, 
right across the, the water here. We're at Lake Norman. Um, the 240 brightest children in Charlotte Mecklenburg got a seat there. Um, that was a local magnet, was a boutique uh, countywide magnet. Only the best and brightest 240 kids out of 140,000 got to go to school there. Um, <clears throat> the only, you know, I happen? told you before, yes? I have a, like we have um, for our school, our school district is growing. And so what they, they propose is an impact fee on housing, new housing. Right. And so they actually asked for a lot, a lot of money. It was going to be like $16,000. Right. For house. That, that's that a was, tax. Yes. That's a yeah. property tax. But so they had to actually have a vote and an approval right. for it. And they came up with $4,000, but they've, the superintendent expressed to us that we need to understand that that is for the building. That, that is, is correct. That is That's what a property it is tax. And that she, can't be she used inside it. of the building. That is correct. Right. So that would be similar to what we're talking about yes. with this case. Yes. Okay. That's correct. That's exactly what we're talking about. Right. And the, the point of the, the, the long winded story about my wife, my wife was at an, an old school there on at, at the campus of Davidson College. It was the worst facility in the county. Had the brightest kids, worst facility in the county. And they knew that those parents had a lot of economic and political pull. So every time a bond prep package was proposed for, <clears throat> for 15 years that that school was open, what was at the top of the list every year? Was all of the renovations, they would have the news media in. This was gonna be, they were gonna make a show place, new buildings, do all these things at this, at this particular, at, at the Davidson IB, at this magnet school all these well-to-do parents. And as soon as the bomb was passed every year, how much money was ever spent on that facility? That would be zero because it's non-binding. They just got, just got people to vote for that so that they could get the money. And so part of the problem with how we fund buildings locally was mostly with bond, it's non-binding. And, and it tends to go to the wealthier parts of town because of political pressure. That's how you get the corridor of shame, is the politics, the local politics in funding facilities. That's the outside. And as Yvonne just pointed out, what she's talking about is, is that, that impact fee, that's just property tax, and that only goes to the facilities. So what the superintendent was proposing in this case was, we're gonna manipulate the money inside of the building. We're gonna take that local money and manipulate it inside the building. You know, we're not gonna manipulate the outside as Mallory was talking about, the corridor of shame reference earlier. You know, that's local politics. You know, certain part of town gets a great new school, another part, they're over there in trailers. That's local politics. We're talking about inside the building now not the external, not the capital money, we're talking about the internal, the per pupil money. So the question is, is can the superintendent move that money? And the answer is no. The Andro said so, you can't do that. Even local money, you can't, you can't move the inside money. You can't, you can't unbalance the money. Now, <clears throat> here's the caveat to that. And we had a case just this summer. <clears throat> what if, you simply move that money and you didn't go to the county commissioners or if you didn't if you didn't go to the school board and get involved in the politics of it what if you just as a superintendent use your discretionary money uh, to to do some of these things where you you tried to impact these at risk schools and give them more money on the inside remember we're talking about the, on the inside now uh, instruction teachers materials, those kinds of things, um, internet, that kind of, what, what if we tried to do that? Well, again, the process is, is the superintendent proposes the budget to the, to the school board that goes through the politics of that, and then it goes to the county commissioners. And so moving money without going to the county commissioners um, would, be, <clears throat> would, be, would be trouble. The superintendent can't just say, I am going to move the money. If the superintendent went to the school board and said, I'm proposed to do this, and then went to the county commissioners, where we were going to give varying amounts of money, that would, <clears throat> on the inside, on the face of that, that would be legal. The illegal part would come from, I just decided I'm going to do this. 
And so this summer, it was discovered that the superintendent, now former superintendent of Chapel Hill Carborough Schools did exactly what this superintendent did in this case study, exactly. We're going to hire a firm and we're going to do some initiatives for at-risk kids in, in some of our, and we're gonna put more resources in those buildings. These people are, we're gonna hire, instead of, we can't hire more teachers state with state money. So we're gonna hire this consulting group and they will provide more, more people and more, and, and more things for, for these particular kids in these buildings in our district, mostly on the Carborough side of Chapel Hill Carborough. Everybody knows Chapel Hill Carborough. Um, for those South Carolina people, Chapel Hill is where obviously UNC Chapel Hill is. They have a school district there, but it's very dichotomous. You have the Chapel Hill side, which is mostly poor and minority. I mean, uh, the Carborough side, which is mostly poor and minority. You have the Chapel Hill side, which is wealthy and white. It's one school district. The, the schools on the Carborough side, uh, they're not as nice as the Chapel Hill schools, but that's that we're talking about inside now. And the superintendent said, I'm going to get them more resources. I can't use state funds and federal funds to hire more teachers. And I can't add more teachers to the local budget. They won't, that's not allowable. Um, those would have to be approved by the, by the school board. Remember, who hires teachers? Not principals, not superintendents. Who hires teachers? School board, right? We went through that on personnel night. And so she could not hire more teachers to put in those, in, in those at-risk schools. So she, what she did was she entered into a contract with a private company who would provide those services. Sounds good so far? Everything good? And so what she said is, is I am allowed as superintendent to spend up to $90,000 at my own discretion. So she entered into a contract for a million dollars and said, bill me in 12 equal installments of 85,000. How's that sound? Shady. <laughs> it just sounds like she's playing the system. Like she knows what to do. She's going around it. Yeah, I mean, well-intentioned, I'm sure, but it. Yeah, well-intentioned. Yeah. Yeah. These kids need extra support, just like this case tonight. It is this case tonight. It's exactly the same thing. The superintendent said, we've got at-risk kids. They need more resources. And we're not talking about buildings. They need more resources inside the building. I'm limited. I can't move those state dollars that pays teacher salaries. Uh, the school board would have to approve the hiring, and, and that money would have to come from the county commissioners. They're not going to do that. And so I am going to privately contract a group based on I can I, I can okay up to ninety thousand dollars, and so instead of having them send me a bill for a million dollars, which I couldn't get paid, I'll have them send me invoice twelve invoices for eighty five thousand. That way I can take local money and get and get extra resources inside the building for these at risk children. Sounds like our state superintendent, Mark Johnson, some of his little schemes he's had over the last couple of years. It is, it's a scheme. Mm -hmm. Now. Well, wouldn't it also be like popular support would not be, well, I guess depending upon how it actually turned out, but. Well, the, the people in Carborough thought it was a great idea. Okay. But they are the unempowered. They don't have a lot of political mm -hmm. pull. What about the parents in the Chapel Hill side, especially a, a retired school principal who lived over there? and had grandkids in the district. What did she know immediately? She knew that this was illegal, didn't she? And so she filed a complaint. So here's that case. It's exactly, unfortunately. Well, we just had $300 million school bond passed. It's the first uh -huh. school board, um, I guess the bond that was passed in like 12 years is what they're saying. Yeah. But um, there's an itemized list, but that was not really, um, I guess, easy to find until after it was voted yes. <laughs> yeah, and and remember that's only for the buildings themselves. Yeah. That that you can't hire you can't hire teachers or do equity with that money. That's only for facilities. 
And that list is non-binding. It is not how the money has to be spent. But to get back to our case tonight, we're not, you know, a set aside, we're not, you know, we're talking about the inside the school money, the money that comes to pay teachers and, and to work specifically with kids on, on the instructional side. Um, and so Baldwin resigns as Chapel Hill Carborough superintendent will lead the system in June. And so they fired the finance director, of course, immediately. Um, they were structured to prevent a board vote to approve a larger contract. And at the time, they'd already paid 250,000 and they still had 767 outstanding. Uh, and they hired education elements. Um, this violated district policy and she resigned from her position. Uh, that was the, uh, the, the um, finance, super, superintendent finance was fired and the superintendent was forced, they allowed her to resign. Um, and so it's exactly what this case is about. This happened just this year. In a, in a large, rather prominent district in North Carolina. It happened just this year where the superintendent said, we're not doing enough for our poor kids. The state is not funding any extra. We know it costs extra to educate them. I'm not talking about buildings. Again, we, got, we have to take the capital piece out. That's the outside, the buildings. It costs more to educate these at-risk kids. Leandro case says that we can't do that with state money. We can't move federal dollars. Local, the, the school board will never, you know, they may, they probably won't, they probably won't recommend it in their budget to the county commissioners and the county commissioners won't fund it. So I am going to take, you know, a little poetic license here. You know, I'm, I'm going to stretch the rules and say, uh, I get to do the 90,000 as often as I want to without having to have board approval or county commissioner approval. And I'm going to enter into this million dollar contract to get these kids the services they need. Um, not legal. So if the person would have just done the year $90,000 for those schools, would that have been justified? You could, she could spend up to 90,000 one time. But she had to do the contract to get that. The contract, you know, for, for the entire year. I mean, yeah. personnel costs money. Right. The ninety thousand wouldn't have, wouldn't have hired but one teacher, mm -hmm. right. but they had you know since she couldn't the board hires teachers she can't hire a teacher superintendent or principal can't hire a teacher who who hires teachers the board since they wouldn't do that she did a contract with a company who brought teachers in but ninety thousand wouldn't get but two teachers. And so she did a million dollar contract and they got, I think they got about 25 teachers and that they allotted to those poorest schools to try to reduce class size and actually inside the building make a difference in the lives of those children. Now the question is, is it legal? No. But the bigger question is, was, was this the right, was it the right thing to try to do ethically, morally? I, I say no, because ethically and morally goes across board. You can't choose. And you, to me, it's like a check and balance because the same way her intentions were to, was to help what she felt was less advantage, someone could do the same thing on the flip side. That's and even exactly working right. with a private company, what if it's somebody I'm affiliated with who owns that company and I'm filtering money to them? So that's the way, you know, that's why I think it was still unethical even though intentions were there. Yeah, the, the intention was, was the, uh, the, the intention was probably pure, but it's unethical to do that. It's exactly right. We see a lot of that, you know, Pam mentioned the, 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 the outgoing state superintendent um, who's been accused of doing a lot of those same kind of contracts on the other side. That's why she pointed out, this sounds like him. Well, it is him. They did this exactly, but they did it the, um, for the other group. Um, a lot of contracts were let um, for for the wealthier schools and for for others. So yes, the problem is is when you know you're in for a penny, in for a pound. It's wrong either way. 
And it, and if you allow this to happen, what you think are, you know, on the side of the angels, the other side is going to use the same thing against you to, to unbalance the scale back in their favor again. Except they're going to double down and do twice as much as you did. Because they, they, they have the, they're, they're part of the ruling, the ruling body. That's the thing you've got to remember. Elections have consequences. When you have a supermajority of one party in the state legislature, you know not only will they will they get to get it back, they'll get it back double. And the issue becomes: we do the right thing always because it's the right thing. We do the legal thing. This is unethical. What the, the and that's what you know the the. I, I know that I, I know the lady, and, uh, and you know I don't know her personally, but I met her professionally, the lady in Chapel Hill. I, I know of her. Uh, she had the best intentions at heart, but she should have taken this course and had this case study. Uh, and the, the, the irony is, is I've been doing this case study for five years, um, and because this is one of the biggies. Leandro is, is the legal case of my lifetime in school funding in the United States of America. Leandro is a national, is, is a watershed case nationally for the states that cling on to flat grant, flat grant funding. They all point to Leandro as the, <clears throat> as the landmark case, you know, as the, as the comp. Now, some, some states, have moved to district power equalizing, where they where they try to to do a more equitable funding base, and they they vary the kids according to local wealth. But for the states that continue to cling to flat grant funding, Leandro is their beacon of light. It is it is the it is the seminal case in the United States of America, not just in North and South Carolina. It is the seminal case now. If that sounds like sour grapes on my part, I've told you before, it is. I was on the legal team for the, the low wealth folks back in the day. Um, so this one still stings. We lost. Uh, not only did we lose, we lost big because they put the provision in there that you couldn't do it on the local level either. I don't think any of us were expecting that. We thought if we lost, it'd be no harm, no foul. But no, we, they, it was punitive. Not only can, can you not, the state won't manipulate the money in order to try to do, a, you know, to, to do some social justice. We're not going to allow the local to do it either. And so not only did we lose big, we lost, I mean, we lost, we lost big. And so um, this is the watershed case for all of us um, in states that have flat grant funding. Now, Somebody mentioned the digital divide a few minutes ago. Um, I was interested. I try not to watch the news. Um, I tend to throw things when I watch the news and break stuff around the house, which makes my wife really angry. Um, <clears throat> but I did watch last night specifically because I wanted to hear, they did a teaser sometime and I knew it was coming on, um, on the Charlotte TV about how Mecklenburg was going to get some CARES money because of the pandemic. Um, and they were going to talk about what they were going to do with that money. And so they're going to put the money toward the digital divide. Um, it's not a lot of money. It's only three and a half million dollars. Um, but what they're going to do is they're going to do some hotspots. And they're going to do some open access. Uh, internet providers free and some hot spots for the people who live in the more rural areas of the county and not in, in Charlotte. Um, but they're going to spend that three and a half million dollars on, on devices and, and access to internet for virtual learning. Um, that's that federal cares money. Um, tell me about that. Give me your thoughts on, on that on that money being used for that. Number one, can it, um, can it be used for something else? Since it's federal money, can it be earmarked or changed to something else? 
That would be no. What do we know about when you get federal money? What's the number one rule of federal money? You have to use it for what you say you're going to use it for. That's exactly right, Bianca. Excellent. When you get federal money, it has complete instructions in terms of uh, when you apply for it and you say, I'm going to use it this way, or if it's available, either way, whether you apply for it like in a grant or whether you are able to qualify for it, doesn't either way, it's completely defined how you're going to use it. And, that, and you can only use it that way, period. No exception. That's, that's what South Carolina is seeing right now because uh, our governor decided to utilize our CARES money and try and put it towards private schools as opposed to public schools. Right. In August, and now um, the South Carolina Supreme Court has ruled that unconstitutional, and he's still fighting it. That is correct. That's exactly right. And even though they might be the same political party, they understand they have to uphold the law. When, the, when you get federal money, you can't monkey the federal money. It, it's what it is, good, bad, or indifferent. And when he had that news conference, and I think we might even mentioned this last week, when I saw his news conference, and I think Steve might have mentioned that he was going to spend it on, on, on private and charter schools, and we're like, <laughs> uh, no, you won't. Uh, you think you will, but no, you won't. Um, that's not how federal money works. And so this federal money is coming to try to, to help with the digital divide, which is, again, wealthy. It's racially and, and financially identifiable and the federal money is coming to try to help that but i'm glad kelsey brought that up i mean these local people even try to subvert that but they in the end he won't win that one you will not you will you will spend federal money as it is intended to be spent and so that's one of those things that's on the side of the angels yes that's a good thing that 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 money is coming for, for to help that digital divide um and so when you get money from the federal government for whatever reason um that's it that that's that's all you get i mean and it has to be spent for that for that reason now also understanding on federal money there's usually some kind of in kind that comes with it um that so that you've got some skin in the game you've got to put some resources with it um and so just remember, federal money, it's completely defined. You, you have no local discretion how that money is spent, period. Whether it's teacher salaries, whether it's TARP money that came in the last economic crisis or CARES money, when federal money comes, whether it's a grant or whether it's an allotment, doesn't matter. You will spend it exactly as, as intended or you will have to pay it back, period. And usually there's some in kind that goes with it, which means you've got to cough up some sort of matching money that goes with it. State monies that come that come to your district come inside the building for teachers, supplies, those kinds of things. They cannot be manipulated. In, in both of our states, our flat grant states, cannot be manipulated. Only, only in states that have district power equalizing DPE could we manipulate those funds inside the building. Local money, again cannot be manipulated it has to be in the, the the budget approved by the board of education and then funded and approved approved and funded by your county commissioners uh, so that money can't be manipulated either the wiggle room is up to ninety thousand dollars in discretionary but that's a one-time thing and it can't be used to circumvent other rules you can't go out and do a million dollar contract and tell them to send me 12 invoices can't do that. That's a perfect example of that. So we're pretty much hemmed in here and financially. That's why you say you got to know what, what accounts you've got and how the money can be spent. And that's the quickest way to the unemployment line and losing your house. Is if you, if you especially if you intend, if your intent was to, to manipulate how the money was spent, other than how it was supposed to be done. So all this goes back really starting in 1966 when we got out of capital funding and we, we went to different fund monies come from different places. The reason why we have the corridor of shame in North and South Carolina is because 
local wealth determines the, the, the number and the quality of the buildings, not, not the, the wealth of the state in general or the state of the economy. It's the local county in which that district resides determines the quality of the buildings that your children go to school in. And what has really hurt that, and, it, and, the, and the, the clarion call or the, the shot heard around the world, as I mentioned before, is the BMW plant in Greenville, South Carolina. That was the first, first time in the history of North and South Carolina that we got into incentivizing a company to come in, in a real way. Um, for those of you who don't know, BMW bu built a plant in, it's actually kind of near, I guess, between Greenville and Greer. Um, and in Greer. Yeah. Yeah. It's in Greer. And um, they basically pay no tax. Um, and so, um, that money came straight off of what would went to school. Uh, Rutherford County in North Carolina, for a little town of Forest City, about an hour and a half west of Charlotte. They have a Facebook plant. Uh, their county is nearly in receivership now because it's, they thought it would bring jobs. It's just a server farm. They didn't get any jobs. Uh, and they gave them tax free in perpetuity, but also spent $20 million up front buying the old mill, tearing it down, improving the site, and gave it to Facebook, who put the building up. They got 12 jobs initially at, at minimum wage for $20 million plus tax free in perpetuity. And so their school district is struggling, their community college is struggling. Please remember. When, when you go to the county commissioners with your school, K-12 school budget, who are you in competition with? Who else goes to the county commissioners for funding? Who else has to be funded by your county commissioners in the county you live in, in North and South Carolina? All the All county agencies. Pam, elaborate on county agencies. Well, so um, police, like uh, economic development. Okay, police, economic development, um, fire, mm -hmm. rescue squad. Yeah. Um, mental health. Community college, mental health, area vocational center. All of those, all of those get in line right with public schools. The big drain in North Carolina, uh, and also in South Carolina, and in terms of the big drain, I, I don't, don't mean that pejoratively. The, 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 the problem that, that K-12 public education has in North and South Carolina is community college or, or vocational schools or state colleges. That's all kind of lumped together as education. And if you have a community college in your county, or if you have an area vocational center, your county has to pay for that. Um, and that, that money is hard to come by. I mean, it, it becomes, they, education competes with education. We compete with the others, but we also compete with ourselves as well. And so it's not like that they have infinite, you know, you know infinite resources. There, there has to be decisions made. And everybody, you know, everybody believes that theirs is the most prescient need. And so if you went to the county commissioners that had a budget, a school budget, that had controversial um, funding in terms of different levels for different ends of the county or different schools, that would be frowned upon by your county commissioners. That would never pass your county commission. The blowback would be too great. So in the end, you get what you get. And you don't even get what you're supposed to get on bond packages because generally, uh, as I said, not generally, but but the the the, the priority list that's generated for that you know in the bond package 
um, is not binding, and it goes back to the political end again. Uh, when we start building those schools or, or refurbishing those schools, um, and we we know that, or or we should know that. Uh, I worked in a district one time that would have did a forty million dollar bond. And this is what they listed that they were going to buy with $40 million. Now, given this was the 1980s, but that's not a million years ago. They said, we're going to build a new high school. We're going to build three new middle schools, and we're going to build six new elementary schools. We're going to build 10 new schools, one of them being a high school, a 3A high school with this $40 million. One high school, three middle schools, six elementary schools with $40 million. What, what, what would be the, 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 the probability of being able to do that with $40 million, even in 1985 dollars? Kevin? Yeah, I don't. I don't see forty million dollars providing facilities that would be adequate. Um, and then you're you're looking at as well. I mean, if those are in addition to the facilities the school system already owns, then you're looking at, you know, having to support those facilities too. That's correct. So just standard operating costs. Yep, your fixed cost every year. So they built the high school first. In 1985 dollars, it cost $28 million to build a new high school. They had $12 million left after the, after the first high school was built. Remember, they're gonna build 10 schools now. They built the first high school, $28 million. And they said, wow, we're, we're, we're not gonna have enough money to build the other nine schools, we don't look like. So why don't we just, Spend five million dollars a piece renovating the other two high schools that didn't, you know, that didn't go out of service. There's three high schools in the county. We'll spend 10, 10 million on them, and then that leaves us two million dollars of seed money to uh, to start one elementary school, and we'll borrow the money on it to finish it. And they had to borrow it on it was like eight thousand, eight million dollars to finish it. It cost ten, and that's how far the forty million dollars got. Now. He said, well, that's an extraneous story. But no, my, my, my point in that story is this. No right-thinking person knew, would have believed that you could build 10 schools for $40 million. Um, it was a complete uh, misrepresentation. It was fraudulent, unethical from the very beginning. Everybody knew it. Um, one board member got voted out, uh, but other than that, there wasn't a lot of blowback. But here's the rest of the story. How long was it before another bond would pass in that county? Twenty years. A long time? Yeah, I was going to say people don't trust that you, after that, they want to vote for it because they don't trust you. That's that's one of the overarching things here as well we have a responsibility to be ethical and moral and legal as administrators but sometimes we work for politicians school board members county commissioners who who, who don't feel any such obligation how would you feel about going out and campaigning for the bond next go round in two to three or four years when you know that the people that you work for are being unethical and you can't, you know, you can't suspend, ask people to suspend disbelief, you know, are you willing to go out and gaslight people and say, well, that was last time. We'll do better this time. We'll tell you the truth this time. But this is the position that many times that you're put in is to support the, these bond packages. This is outside of the scope of Leandro, but it goes along with that. You're, you're asked to pull on people's heartstrings and, and, and these kids need this, you know. They live in the corridor of shame. They need a new building over there. 
when you know good and well that they have no intention of building them a school. So 15 years, the IB school was open at Davidson. They never spent a nickel over there. They eventually closed it because it got condemned and couldn't go any further. That was the end of the IB school at Davidson. And every bond package that came up, it was first on the list and it never got a penny. We, we do those kinds of things. Um, they, they never got a dime, ever. Um, and we know those kinds of things politically because of who's, who's, who, who the political makeup of our school boards and our county commissioners. But you're gonna be asked as school administrators, this is a big thing. I wish Steve was with us tonight. This is a big thing, especially in rural counties. You know that you have, you will have as school leaders. You will have very. You'll be a celebrity in in a lot of small towns. You'll be a celebrity, and you'll be asked to go out and campaign and 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 to actively work to try to get school bonds passed to get money in for facilities. And you're going to know just looking at them that. In, and understanding how funding works and, and the cost and that there's no way that everything on this list can get funded. And more than likely my community isn't gonna get anything, but I've got to go out and convince my, and tell my parents to vote for it anyway, uh, knowing up front that we're lying to them and I'm a part of it. Um, and don't think these aren't political moves. My last story before we get move on and I'll, I'll be done with stories tonight is, is <clears throat> Charlotte Mecklenburg School set aside $6 million for the high school challenge for three high schools. Um, Uh, Steve texted me. He's not going to be able. He's his internet's out. I guess the storm knocked his out. Okay. Um, Six million dollars for the high school challenge. This was right before. This is when Judge Manning ruled that what was going on in Charlotte Mecklenburg was genocide. I'm not making that term up. That's what he called it. Um, what was going on in Charlotte Mecklenburg was genocide. We, uh, we had a superintendent and a board who took all of the remedial money, all, and put it into AVID for middle-class kids to try to get to college. And we completely stopped all of our remedial programs. Our dropout rate went through the roof. We started telling kids at, at 18 they could no longer come to school because they weren't making adequate progress. We refused to do freshman academies. We stopped relooping. We did everything we could to drive all these kids out of, our, out of our buildings. One particular party, and you can imagine which one, got control of the county commission. And that, as a result of that, this is what happened. And Judge Manning said, this is genocide. Um, and so what happened was, what, uh, in, during this time, there was a high school challenge for West, for West Charlotte, Garinger, and West Meck, um, two million apiece, six million dollars, that they were spending to try to help these high school students not to drop out and to get through school. Um, they've taken all the money. I was high school principal at the time. They'd taken all of our money for remedial, had to let all those teachers go and all the programs we had going on all went. The gang of four got control of the Mecklenburg County Board of Commissioners. Um, and, you know, it, it just it, it just got ugly in a hurry. And so they campaigned on six million dollars giving six million dollars to these schools uh it's all the money in the world um can't believe we're wasting six million dollars uh, on, on these three high schools and and got that funding stopped and that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back the lawsuit and judge manning stepped in and said you people are just awful uh, this is genocide what you're doing now that six million dollars that was that was a political campaign that they were running the six million dollars you know we're spending all the money we got on these three high schools for this high school challenge program <clears throat> part of the problem that we have in education is messaging 
if the politicians are able to go out and say six million dollars that's all the money in the world we need to find a way to message to our parents and i guess you run the risk of, of, of raising the ire of these politicians what somebody needed to do on the other side of that argument the politicians that were running against their politicians should have been able to say you do realize that six million dollars <clears throat> is less than half of one percent of the school budget let me say that again for equity for high school graduation to do the right thing is less than half of one percent of the budget the budget in charlotte mecklenburg at that time was 1.4 billion dollars 1.4 billion six million dollars represents 0.45 of one percent of the budget most right-minded people would say that's not a lot to try to do an equity initiative in these three failing high schools but the other side was claiming six million dollars was all the money in the world now six million dollars is a lot to me and you but in a 1.4 billion dollar budget what we should have been doing on our messaging is is this is this is such a small part of our budget to do the right thing but one of the things that we haven't done in the business is we haven't pointed out to people all of these rules, all these discrepancies that you should be able to intellectually explain to people about why things are like they are, because you should understand all these funding issues. We had a state representative from, from Mecklenburg County um, who ran on the, his platform was, <clears throat> I'm going to get in the state legislature in order to get more money to, from the from the state to build more schools in, in this part of, of Charlotte. What's wrong with that argument? Malcolm said, I'm running, elect me to the state legislature from this district that covered part of Mecklenburg, part of Charlotte, North Charlotte, because I'm going to get in the state legislature and get them to give more money to Charlotte to build schools. What's wrong with that argument? The county provides the money for the buildings. State doesn't give, doesn't build anybody's schools. There is no fund, state fund to build schools. Malcolm didn't know that. So what happened when Malcolm got elected? How long did Malcolm last? One two year term. And what did the community? We wonder how certain communities can vote for certain politicians who you know that, that don't represent them and don't have their best interest at heart. That's how that happens. That's how a community that shouldn't ever elect that particular, one particular party all of a sudden does because they elected their person who said, I'm gonna go to Raleigh and get you more money for your school because he didn't know Raleigh doesn't have any money for your school. It's all local capital is all local money and so after his two years he got defeated by the other party first time they'd ever elected anybody in that part of town from that political party because the backlash malcolm didn't deliver us any money he wasn't working for us <clears throat> malcolm what's malcolm gonna say i'm stupid i didn't know that the state didn't have any money for, for buildings Guilty as charged. I didn't get you any money for buildings. He didn't want to say, well, I didn't know at the time there wasn't any money because I told you there was. So the big, a, a bigger part of all this funding is, is who needs to be the community's resource on how dollars work? That would be you. <laughs> that would be you. You need to be your community's resource on how money works. Federal money, state money, local money, which includes capital, and then school funds, the two accounts you have at your school. You should be the expert on that money. 
you should be the person that's the contact person in your community for how and how funding works for schools. You can be a great resource, not only as an administrator in your building, because you're such wizards at instruction, if you know how funding works, you should be able to be a point of information, a font, uh, you know, a fountain of wisdom for your community as well, to help them make informed decisions about the people that they elect to make decisions for them. That's part and parcel of this as well. If you know the rules, you can help other people to know the rules as well and how it works. If you know, for example, that you've got a community college in your county, that they're going to be your biggest competition for money. And that you might can figure out and let people know that and can figure out ways that you can that that you can be a force multiplier, like early college and those kinds of things. You, 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 you have to understand that police and fire in your, in your town or your county are your competition for funding as well. I don't like the term, but one of the things that, that, that came out of this last election cycle was defund the police. That was not anybody wanting to, to lay off the police department. What they were wanting to do is because the money comes for, the, for mental health, and police come from the same from the same pot from the county commissioners. Why don't we, you know, spend less on tactical and, and military equipment for the police and put more into mental health? That was the argument. We need to look at how we fund, you know, our, what we do with our local property tax money. But since so many people don't understand the funding model, they thought what folks were talking about was we just won't have police. We'll just have anarchy in the streets. No. We were looking at the funding model of, of why do we send police when somebody's having a mental health crisis? Because we don't have any mental health professionals. We spend our money on police. Imagine that, sending armed people to, you know, to deal with a crazy person. What could go wrong with that? Uh, it's just amazing to me. But again, it's a lack of knowledge of how money works. That's the root of a lot of the problems that we have and the messaging that we have is folks don't understand how the money works. You have a resource in the facilities book that speaks to a lot of these things. There's some, some PowerPoints. You need to dig a little deeper into, you know, I've tried to give you an overview of, of, of these different things, the laws and, and the rules behind all of this. And you can't just depend upon this is a good idea. This is the right thing to do. Everybody won't see it as the right thing to do like you do. And so you have to help people to understand all the policy and law around all of these issues. And then hopefully that will help them to a, a, a more equitable decision for all communities and all kids. Uh, and again, you know, even the best intentioned people like Malcolm, uh, he hurt more in the long run than he ever helped by not understanding the funding model. And then his community felt betrayed and, and, and went the other way. Uh, that's real, that happened. All right, questions about anything so far? All right, who's gonna be next in the presentations? I'm watching our time. I, I'm, I'm, I've blown myself out here. The hurricane has passed through. Who's next? Kelsey, is that us? I can't see the list. I, was, right. I think we're group one, so I think we were we at go. the end of the night. Okay, okay, okay. But we can go. All <laughs> right, I'm, I've already made you the host. All right. No good deed goes unpunished for this bunch. <laughs> All right. Can y'all see my PowerPoint? Yes. All right. Let's roll back on my dog. We're going to pretend that didn't happen. <laughs> All right. 
So we're looking, of course, as we all know, at uh, the letter from the superintendent. Okay, so Leandro versus North Carolina. Uh, go ahead and go to that next slide for me. Is um, the problem in this case is that money is being disproportionately spent among students in these counties. Um, they didn't have the financial back end to provide an equal education for every student. Um, and the quality of the, of the student's education um, was very much dependent on the amount of taxes that were paid mm -hmm. in that district. That's correct. Um, I, I thought I heard you saying somebody shaking their head or <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Um, and, um, you know, what I always, what I really heavily thought about when, when Kelsey and I were looking over this case is like, we have rental property and even though the tenants don't pay rent, so I feel like the, the people who live in rent houses, people look at them and say, oh, well, they're not paying their way. They're not um, contributing. But as the landlord, I'm the one who does that. Mm -hmm. for so, I mean, like, so all, all the inner city kids, everyone's like, well, they don't even pay taxes. But the people who own the apartments or the, you know, the um, houses they rent from, those taxes are being paid. So I don't mm -hmm. think that, I don't think the funding should be reduced for them because the, uh, the, the ta taxes are still being paid on the property. Sorry, I'm not able to talk tonight, yeah. but um, let's see. Um, That's being part of that, my argument about if everybody understood the rules. Right. Um, we wouldn't be able to advance some of these false narratives. Right. Um, that they don't deserve this, they don't pay anyway, so why do they deserve this? Well, yes, those taxes are still being paid. The, the taxes are still being paid. I can, that is correct. I you understand that. Again. But, you know, the other side will not let the facts get in the way of a good story. Now, you've got to understand that. Your opponents won't always play fair. Right. They'll right. play fast and loose with the truth now, but that, that's part of you got to know. Um, and in previous years, I used to work for Stokes County Schools, and I've actually, I, I was accused once of writing up a false contract for someone for one of our properties just to live, live in the district. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy the way people treat people who aren't actually landowners within the community. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's a whole another, another can of worms. Um, but the Supreme Court eventually ruled that um, schools are obligated to make sure every child has an equal education um, based on just general curriculum skills, um, geography, history, economic, political understanding, and all the opportunities that are allowed, that allow students to succeed, to have secondary transition, training, um, furthering their education and gainful employment. So um, I pulled a quote from Rose versus the Council on Education, which is actually a precursor to Leandro in 1989. Um, it said, the children of the poor and the children of the rich, the children who live in poor districts and the children who live in the rich districts must be given the same opportunity and access to an adequate education. This obligation cannot be shifted to local counties and local school districts. And this um, Rose versus uh, COE was adopted by the courts in the states of Alabama, Arkansas, Kansas, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Texas, and of course, most important to us here on this chat is South Carolina and North Carolina. All right. So Kelsey is absolutely right. The Rose case. The problem is with the language in the Rose case. Adequate education. So that's exactly now the Leandro case echoed that. They just called it a basic education. What they're saying is, is whatever the state gives you, that's all you're entitled to. You're not entitled to the same as the same as everybody. As long as we give you a basic level, access to what whatever adequate is, 
That's all you're, you're entitled to. You're not entitled to the same as everybody's not entitled to the same. So what this does is creates the inequity and perpetuates inequity because it says adequate. North Carolina, Le Leandro just said basic. That's how they can justify that in the end, kids in Mecklenburg get 12,000 per pupil for inside for instruction and kids in Hoke still only get eight. That, therein lies your problem. Um, it's either adequate or basic. It doesn't say the same. None, none, none of these cases that everybody gets the same. And if everybody gets the same, we'd have to manipulate the money. Nope, everybody gets the same. You know, everybody gets the same opportunity to an adequate, not the same money, the same opportunity to adequate or basic. Therein lies the, it's semantics, but it, 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 it's the, the heart of the entire case. Okay, so the name of this case study is the letter to the community. And in this case study, they talked about um, how funding should be um, distributed among students. Um, and they talked about how they were going to pilot um, programs at four schools and provide funding based on the number of students enrolled and their needs rather than splitting it up and their specific needs rather than splitting it up equitably and to make sure that the money that is um, given to the students is actually spent or the money that is uh, allotted for each student is actually spent on those particular students. So pulling from um, our text on resource management for school admin, priority-based budget, excuse me, priority-based budgeting is designed to bring about a cultural change in the way that an organization does its budgeting process so that it's more effective and efficient, results-oriented, and customer-focused. And school-based or site-based budgeting or student-based budgeting falls within that priority-based budgeting category. So a few cases that kind of flow alongside Leander as well um, were in 2004, Hope County versus the state. It's also called Leander II. Uh, they ruled that the state funding failed to provide a sound basic education uh, for the students that was laid out within Leandro one um, that then flowed into um, the fight with charter schools in Sugar Creek Charter School versus State, where um, the charter school uh, was arguing that the state did not provide capital funding uh, for the students. That was dismissed. <laughs> because the state doesn't do capital funding. That is exactly. correct. <laughs> And they then, should have, they should have read the law. They could have saved a lot of money. They could have. That's a lot of court cases, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Hart versus State in 2015. Um, the voucher program for um, private schools. Um, it was originally ruled that uh, that violated constitutional provisions, but then in 2015 that was reversed um, because, as I think we all know, voucher programs are legal. Um, in the majority of states. That's correct. And finally, there's um, Silver et al. versus Halifax County in 2016, where um, segregation is maintained in predominantly African-American districts in North Carolina, and those districts are underfunded. Uh, that case was dismissed, but they're looking at a potential appeal at this time. Um, I believe they're trying to pull in the facts to have that case um, or bring about some evidence within that case. Okay, that one was a result of the 2001 ruling in the Capuchon lawsuit that said if, if schools resegregate, that busing was no longer mandated, and if schools resegregate, that the state had no, <clears throat> had no duty to redress that resegregation and the financial disparities that come along with it. That's Capuchon lawsuit. That was in our court cases. That is still the law of the land. Hopefully that one will get overturned at some point. But when the Swan case, the 30 years was up on the Swan case, 1971, the Swan case, national case, 
Julius Chambers argued before the Supreme Court um, that created busing for just for um, for integration that lasted 30 years. The Capuchon lawsuit ended it in 2001, and they the, and the the people who were were arguing against stopping integration or busing for integration said schools will resegregate if this happens and the the findings said busing is over and if schools resegregate there is no duty for the state or the local to redress that resegregation and the financial disparities that come along with it so this is a direct challenge 15 years later uh, to that ruling in 2001 um, but they will appeal. Now, again, elections have consequences. Um, so just like the Hope versus the state in 2004 was a different time, uh, the Andrew 2, you had a more favorable court during that time. Unfortunately, even then, they did not set about, they didn't, it did not, it did not change the state funding formula. So what happened was as a result of the Andrew, and they said, well, you know, We'll try to help some of and, and more directly, Leandro, too. Um, they're not getting the basic aid. We'll, we'll, we'll give some, some, some pork barrel money uh, to these individual poor counties. We'll give them a little extra money. Now, we're not going to change the funding formula for what goes on inside the buildings. What we'll do is, is we'll give them a little extra capital money. And who knows where that capital money is? It's pork barrel. You don't get it in a formula. It, it just, we just, we grant it to you. The General Assembly grants it to you. Where does that money come from in North and South Carolina? What regressive tax have we created in North and South Carolina to fund that pork barrel? We give it to our friends money. What's a regressive tax? Anybody know? It's not the penny taxes, but I know South Carolina has one of those. The lottery. <laughs> That's how we got state lotteries in North and South Carolina was the Andrew case. Regressive tax is a lottery. Poor people pay it on themselves. Who plays the lottery disproportionately? That'd be <laughs> poor folks. Money. Not affluent people. <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but. Yep. You don't see too many folks at the convenience store in suit and tie buying scratchers, do you? <laughs> seriously that's how we got the lottery the north carolina and the south carolina education lottery was out of leandro they said you know we're not going to change the state formula we'll we'll create a fund to give you know on a case-by-case -case basis to our friends we'll we'll give them money for capital projects and somebody said well where are we going to get the money from and somebody said Let's have a lottery. And that's how we got the lottery in, in Bible Belt states that didn't, would have never considered having a lottery. That's how we got the education. That's why we call them education lottery. Now the education lotteries have been a complete failure in terms of funding money for school. It's a complete pork barrel in terms of, we give it to our friends and they waste it, steal most of it. And only what is it, 17 cents on a dollar ever gets, you know, gets through the system. Um, by the time you pay the lottery company, all the advertising on TV, you pay out the winners, there's not much left. And they do a scholarship program out of it as well. And so by the time it gets, there's not many pennies left. And then, you know, the, the famous case was they, they did a commercial until public outcry, they stopped it pretty quickly. They had the superintendent from Stokes County Schools on and said, we built a cafeteria with our money. So all 300 of our students at our high school would eat lunch at the same time. As if he wasn't smart enough or the high school principal wasn't smart enough to figure out how to run two lunch shifts. Uh, and so they wasted the money on a new cafeteria. I mean, and that, um, that and some other things. Uh, and that's been pretty much a, a hoax as well. But yes, that is Leandro and Leandro too is how we got state lottery. By the way. All right, so let's go on to the four basic questions of priority based budgeting. Um, why are we providing the service? Um, 
Leonardo versus North Carolina uh, established that equal opportunity to education should be available for all students. What are we buying these, uh, what are we buying for these services? Student achievement, student success. It's not based on their parents' tax bracket or the community they're living in, but it should be equal access to education for all students. Um, who are we serving? The students and their families. And, and I'm gonna go ahead and say by serving, we're gonna say education, uh, we're going to say the community, all the stakeholders, everyone together, because school is more than just the building and the teachers. It's the whole community raising, it's the whole village raising children. And how much does it cost? Varies by, uh, depends on the level of education, uh, their level of needs, and their level of risk. So some students will uh, require different levels and different like special education of course is going to cost more because there's more intensive services and um like we're just kind of different we we need more hands-on for a, a general content teacher has all their curriculum we actually have to have they have their state curriculums well i'm i'm gonna say that um but we we need specialized instructional tools that must be purchased based on the needs of our students. <clears throat> Let me point out again. Let me point out again. Leandro said everybody gets a basic level. They didn't say everybody gets the same. Right. They said everybody gets a basic level and we will fund that basic level only. On their needs. Um, and and that, that this is that everybody will get the same from the state. That the other that districts are able to add more to that, mm -hmm. um, we, we're not going to touch that. So if you're in an affluent community, your kids will get twelve thousand dollars per year per pupil spent on their inside the building education, and and the people in poor districts who are just barely able to pay for their own buildings won't be able to spend any extra money as long as they get our money. They get a basic level, and that's all that they're guaranteed is that basic level. We in no way say that everybody should get the same as long as we as, as we got a baseline here. And so that that is what Leandro said. Now we can argue that that that's not that that's not fair and equitable, but it, it is. I mean that that's that's the law. That according to them, as long as you get a, a basic education, that is fair and equitable. That you don't get the same as somebody in a more fluent community, that's just the, the you know, the accident of birth. Um, that we don't have any responsibility to, to fix those social injustices. As long as you're getting the basic ed, that's, that's as far as we're going to go. And we're not going to allow you to manipulate that even at the local level to try to balance that out. That's against the rules as well. So that, that in the kernel of truth in Leandro is, is as long as you're getting the basic, all is well. And if you aren't getting the basic like in Leandro too, we'll, we'll create an illusion of giving your district a little more money uh, if you apply for it. But again, it doesn't change what goes on the inside of the building. The money that comes from the lottery is on the outside of the building. It's on the capital money. It still doesn't affect that per pupil spending on the inside of your building. That's why Leandro's back in court again, trying to get them to look at, hey, wait a minute, we didn't say we needed more money for buildings. What we said was we needed more money inside the building. Nope, they, we, we still can't get, we can't move this one political party and this group off of the notion that what goes on inside the building is what's most important. Uh, as long as you just get, you know, the basics, you're good to go according to them. And that kind of leads us, I think, into um, our different paradigms here. And the first being justice, um, which really focuses on like fairness, things being equitable, things being just. 
Um, students are provided funding based on their individual needs, which um, truly is the definition of equitable. Everyone gets what they need, not, not an equal amount. Um, the money traveling with the student from school to school within the district, within the state, um, as necessary as that student moves, um, keeps it fair for the number of students within the school building. So if it was just based on a school um, itself, you know, the number that they start with at the beginning of the year and that's it, you get more students halfway through the year, you're going to have less money to spend on all of those extra students. And if the money is used as intended, there shouldn't be an issue with it being equitable to all students. And it says fair, but that's a typo on my part. Equitable um, there to all students. Now, we've thought about some uh, differences that might make this unjust, unequitable, or unfair. Um, thinking about how would a pocket of a school with a pocket of students that have higher needs, um, a lower income area, how would that affect the um, school-based budgeting or site-based budgeting process. And also looking at um, the dynamics of how is money spent and tracked by student. And that would be um, obviously digging deeper into the budgeting itself within the district uh, to pay attention to how they spend and track their money. But uh, we don't have access to that information in this particular case study. So under care, um, Leonardo in that, um, in that court case says schools, um, are not exhibiting enough care for student needs, enough instruction, enough attention, only those in the higher tax brackets. The Supreme Court of North Carolina ruled that it was up to the schools to care for students' needs equitably, and you all know what that means. Hey, the teachers will provide um, school-based budget, an example, um, school-based budgets um, attempt to make fair, purport, divide the money fairly between all students, um, so no one population has a higher advantage over the others, and uh, just in order to say, hey, every child is worthy to have the same amount of care, same amount of funding, same level of education, uh, regardless of their circumstances. And then looking at uh, critique, uh, focusing mostly on power, social class, and the human rights side of things. In Leandro, the students were not provided for equitably in the four counties that took their case to court. And the Supreme Court of North Carolina ruled that to be the case. Um, School-based budgeting is an attempt to account for those inequities and to provide for students based on their needs. Um, little power um, is at play if you look at the fact that each student is provided a set amount with percentages based on um, their needs, their risk, their grade, um, and that money travels with them. So it can't be, you know, the fourth graders at this school are definitely getting more money than the fourth graders over here at this school because their parents pay more taxes. And um, some people may actually push back because the schools with the higher at risk populations are going to be receiving more funding on paper to provide for these students, even though it is equitable to get those students their basic educational needs. And that's kind of hard because the, the, the kids who attend lower, uh, the schools that have the higher population of the socioeconomic, lower socioeconomic level, um, they don't have the PTSAs that raise money. They don't have the parents who are willing to contribute. So, I mean, I, I can see how in, on paper that says that it's more equal, but it's not. Um, profession. Let's see. Um, from letter from the superintendent. So this is basically from this case study, the um, superintendent wrote a letter to stakeholders just explaining the process and policies being adopted and to make the whole um, system transparent. The whole, every, how we're going to do this. 
Um, they also help to make sure that everyone had access to um, information, um, access to, you know, because I mean, even when things are explained in a letter, I always have questions. People have questions. People may have higher understandings or lower un understandings of what's in the letter. But I think everyone's like Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools is going through huge transitions right now. We had a new superintendent come in, just totally has um, dismantled our school system and now she's resigned. So where do we go? We've got a lot of questions. We're attending school board meetings. We are speaking up. We've got our Facebook um, page, uh, whatever pages that we're just trying to hash out. Well, what are we gonna do? They're wanting us to go back to school. We had a, a teacher die this past week because she went back to school. I chose not to, but that's a whole nother set of issues. But um, yeah, it's just it's just a lot. But there's transparency needs to be uh, all these decisions and the reasons these decisions are made. The whole process needs to be transparent. Um, let's see, morally and ethically, uh, this holds up Leandro versus North Carolina as it takes into consideration student best interests and provides, um, ensures that Rose versus Council of Education, those provisions laid out in that lawsuit are being held up. And those provisions are the same ones that are echoed again in Leandro about mm -hmm. um, meeting your um, geography and science and math, et cetera. Yep. And then our conclusions here, um, Leandro sets the pace for school-based bu budgeting procedures. Um, by accounting for our at-risk students' needs, we can provide a more equitable education for those students. And by keeping our stakeholders aware of the processes and changes, um, we keep a democratic structure within the school system behind um, our changes in budgeting processes amongst other things. And that's what we got. <laughs> okay. Please remember in this particular case, superintendent cannot go out and do this. If we want to do school-based budgeting for a district, who would have to be the, who would have to make that decision? to fund school-based budgeting. That would be the county commissioners. Um, the, the superintendent could propose it in the budget. The, the school board could approve that budget, pass it to the county commissioners. The county commissioners could approve that. But the superintendent upon their own volition as in Chapel Hill Carborough cannot say, I'm going to do an equity funding model and, and vary the amount of money going to the schools because that would have to be done by the, by the school board and then funded by the county commissioners. They would have to make that decision and not the superintendent. What I'm not saying that the superintendent has a bad idea here. I'm talking about the legal steps to get this done. Again, remembering where the money comes from, who spends the money and what the rules are on the money. Superintendent had a great idea, school-based budgeting. We're gonna get, the, we're gonna get more resource, resources to where they're needed except you can't circumvent, you know, the transparency piece, can't you know, you can't circumvent the school board because they're elected officials and they've got to be answerable to the voters. And you can't circumvent the funding authority, which is the county commission. And so you can't move federal money, you can't move state money, you can't move local money, you can have it approved up front, but you can't just move it once it's already once the budget's already set for the year, you can't start moving it for equity, even though it might be the right thing to do. It's not the legal thing to do, as the lady in Chapel Hill Harbor unfortunately found out. Uh, you can't be moving that money around once it's already been budgeted. And you would have to get your school board to agree to an equity model, and you'd have to get your county commissioners to agree and fund that. And they would get blowback from their voters and from people that, that realize that if we agree to this, we're taking money from our kids. We, we would like for those kids to have more, but not if we're having to, our kids are getting less in order to do it. Not in my backyard. What is that, NIMBY? Not in my backyard? Yeah, it sounds good to you. I realize, wait a minute, 
you're going to take money from my kid to do that. That becomes a big, that becomes a, a big issue. So again, it, it, it is allowable, but it's got to go through the budget process through the, 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 the official budget from the school board that is funded, approved and funded by the county commission. So that's the thing to remember on this. All right, oh, who's our Lamb. next person? Oh, Dr. Lamb. Yes. It's not us, but I have a question. Yes. And it might be a silly question, but um, so, I mean, when it goes to the county commissioner, like you're saying, that's generally a rubber stamp, like, right? Can you think no. of a time when they send it back? I mean, do they send it back and, not a rubber Absolutely stamp? Absolutely, they, they send it send back. It back. Okay. It generally takes about four months to go through that bargaining process. And they go through each piece and say, we will go for this, we won't go for that. It is not a rubber stamp in any, by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. They have their political constituencies remembering they've got to fund all these other people as well, community colleges, area vocational schools, police, fire, public services, uh, social services, um, all, all those things, everybody comes to them for money in that county. And they have to they have to satisfy all their constituents. And so no, it is not a rubber stamp. And they have political agendas. Mm -hmm. Which complicates. Exactly. And and so what the superintendent is trying to do, what the, the superintendent in Chapterville Carborough was circumvent that whole political system that she knew she would never get them to agree to do this. She was trying to figure out a way around it to get extra support for the kids that needed it because she knew that it, publicly that she would never be able to get through all those barriers, all those legal barriers to get to where she'd never get the school board to go for it and she'd never get the county commissioners to go for it. So she took it upon herself, just like this superintendent wrote a letter to the community, took it upon himself. And the point of the story is you're not allowed to do that, but once. Uh, and then you have to find no, you have to find more work, different work. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. That's the way that works, unfortunately. You can't super, you can't circumvent the process on money. That's if you don't learn anything else from all these rants that I have. They're actually scripted rants, but. You don't learn anything else. You can't diddle the money. There's rules and it's, and it's not debatable. I mean, you know, yeah, you did it or no, you didn't. You can't argue in the court of public opinion. I did the right thing for the, I did the wrong thing for the right reason. No, you did the wrong thing. You know, and that's the hardest thing. That's the hardest thing for people with compassion who understand what it takes to educate kids. That's the hardest thing for us to understand and agree and, and get on. But we have to understand that they hired us to follow the rules. That it may be the right thing to do, it's just not the legal thing to do. And you gotta know the rules. The lady in Carver, she wasn't stealing the money. She wasn't giving it to friends and family members. She was trying to get extra support to the kids that needed it, the at-risk kids. And Pam just mentioned the former superintendent in Winston-Salem, she was doing the same thing. She restructured the entire district to, to try to work on equity. She only stayed a year because she knew she was gonna get fired here pretty quickly. So she left before they could, she divorced them before they could divorce her because the backlash had started. She was trying to do a more equitable model in terms of school-based model, but, but folks didn't like that. The politicians did not like that. Parents didn't like that. Teachers exactly, didn't like that. Because you're taking from mine to give to somebody else's. My my number one priority is my child. Hired hired district level administration positions. Removed all of our supports. Removed um, our EC case managers who and and said, oh yeah, we're going to train UEC teachers on how to do this paperwork. Still haven't received that. I'm out of my because they were spending FMLA, local money. I'm done with that. She, they were spending local money on federal programs that they weren't required to spend. If she could cut those, she could shift those resources to at-risk kids who weren't identified. Yep. That's exactly what she was doing with that. She was trying to do an equity model within the rules, but even then, the long knives come out. That's exactly right. The long knives come out. 
she took a, I read this week, she took a $50,000 pay cut plus bonus. Mm -hmm. She went from 215 to 165, but at least she's got a job. Exactly. She was politically aware enough to know that she'd already burned all of her bridges. She did. Um, again, maybe if she'd had this course in finance, she'd have <laughs> known that how, how this story was going to end. It wasn't going to end well. And it might have been she just she voted her conscience. She did what she thought was the right thing, regardless of what the, 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 the blowback was going to be. She did the right thing. I'll give it a bit of the doubt. I'm just glad she's gone. All right. Who's next? We're going we're gonna to run out of time if we don't get in a hurry here. We are. All right. Lisa. Okay, I'm gonna jump right in. Um, I'm not gonna go over this. I'm just gonna kind of fast forward to some of the right, things. Right. Um, some of the things that we have not said about the Leandro case. One of the things is still ongoing. It's one of those things that keeps turning itself over. And um, a new what one part that they did do is that they had to come up with an outside agency to come up with a plan for the state of North Carolina to come up with making. Um, counties and districts come up with short and long-term plans and they got to have to report back on those short and long-term plans um, for how they're going to handle this situation the other thing about that is is that it has to be updated because where it says like an equitable education a basic education we have to now take into account what does that mean we have to get kids prepared for um this technological age so everything that we're teaching will also means for this age that we're coming into now. Okay, I'm good with that. So um, we looked at it from the superintendent's point of view. And so on one side, we understand what student-based budgeting is and how it could be beneficial for the students on, on the lower end, like the ones who need the additional resources that aren't necessarily getting the um, resources that they need and we um, looked at the formula that would address uh, the students needs versus um, the, their diverse needs and just everything that they would need and we know that money would empower the school leaders but on the other side of that um, which is where we actually landed was that um, if the revenue was not there where was that money coming from and so this was the conversation that we were having um, was it local state flow through federal reserves and so i'm glad that that actually got answered um and what can be played with and what needs to stay exactly the way it is um we also looked at the flat grant formula which is the amount of aid per pupil um and then we also noticed that in the book it was renamed between student-based and site-based so in mm -hmm. one spot it's called student-based and another but it's called site-based, but we actually brought that up in our conversation was that, yes, these students need the additional resources, but you can't take those resources away from other students um, just because there's a discrepancy in the, in the amount of income. So Yeah, you know, that plan that Tiffany just talked about, that's local, got to figure out how you're going to address these inequities, but you can't take from one, you can't Robin Hood, you can't right. take from one. You got to come up with additional money. That's the problem for the locals, and the courts have thrown it back on the locals to come up with the additional money, not the state. So then we have the legal and ethical side of it, and um, we were kind of talking about what trying to balance it out, and a lot of this was talking about today. So the legal issue, the role of the principal was that um, they making the school um, budget available 
and school improvement plans. Um, we talked about school choice, number of students enrolled, like you can get into the legalities of that if you're doing per, per student and revising the formula of the job of the state, not the LEA. So he can't just, as we talked about, he cannot just start moving money the way he would like to um, in it, when it's coming from state down. On the ethical side, we spent some time talking about, just like what you said, you know, the Robin Hood effect. So mm -hmm. if we're taking from students, um, you know, who might not have that need, and that's exactly what we saw um, in the case that we were looking at. So every child has the opportunity to receive a sound education. Um, some of the other things that we talked about was the pilot schools. So how were the four schools picked? Um, and was that a diverse sample size? What did that look like? And you know, the criteria for that was, um, was that kind of set up? Um, we felt like the actions were well-intended, even though it was not um, legal. <laughs> yeah, wasn't well thought out. The, the, the rationale, I mean, was well-intentioned. Mm -hmm. It's just, you can't do this. And so, let me move us, I'll put us in the middle. Um, so the four paradigms of justice. So we talked about the fairness and it being equitable. Um, so really looking at making sure that we have that policy and that we're following the policy. Um, because if we're not doing that, that's where that loyalty and trust really comes into play. And um, you know, you're gonna have to have, build that time to build the relationships and kind of reconnect, just like we spoke about with the the money, if you misuse money or you're not, you know, being really transparent about how you're using that money, that's where that loyalty and trust comes mm -hmm. into play. Um, for critique, we spoke about the power, um, social class, we spoke about the human rights and just what that looks like when you are, you know, how, how is the money going to be allotted? Um, and then what is the right way to go about that, the legal way? <laughs> Um, and then also making sure that you are following that policy that's set forth. For our profession, um, we spoke about the self-awareness and that reflective practice to make sure that we are being transparent in how we're making decisions and following the policy. And then also making sure that we do have the best interest of students. Um, you know, their, their rights, their responsibility, their right to a sound education um, and making sure that we are providing that. And that is a fast zip through our presentation. <laughs> Good. All right. All right, do we have one final presentation? Who's gonna do it? I'll share. Okay, so um, very quick. We talked about, is the superintendent's plan appropriate? Um, we acknowledge that this is not legal at all, but it's a well-intentioned plan that has the right. high-risk student's needs at the forefront, which is what we've all talked about. Um, he's being very transparent regarding the budget and the plan for allocating money to the stakeholders even though it's illegal. Um, it, it sounds like a very well laid out plan and he is being very open and transparent with what the money is, what he wants to use the money for. And um, he's allowing parents in the community opportunities to offer input and ask questions regarding this, um, these major decisions. Um, when he put in there in the letter, I can't think of it verbatim, but where he did put in there that uh, if you have any questions, you'll be able to contact the, the school principal and there'll be more information out there. So that's what we deemed appropriate from the plan, even though it is not a legal plan, which was what we constantly talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and so our second, just talking about what's not appropriate, it's um, you can't do that. <laughs> we said that, every group said that. So it's, you can't just make up your own funding formula, decide where you want the money to go. Um, that the 
um, plan again, well intentioned, um, and you know, seems like the right thing to do is not legal. You can't do it. All right, the legal and ethical concerns. So just some themes throughout here. Um, we were talking about this earlier with having to present to the school board and then having to go through the county commissioners um, to provide, gen, generate any guidelines that were presented to the school board about changing the way um, the schools were going to operate. This uh, process should also include an opportunity for the public to comment before implementation. So it was good to, you know, say, hey, if you have any questions, reach out. But it was kind of a, hey, this is just what we're going to do. <laughs> and dealing with taxpayers, you know, there needs to be some type of public, you know, communication before just a big decision like that. Um, all stakeholders need to be involved with the knowledge of how resources impact the school and student achievement. Um, funds should fuel a school's vision and goals, but also ensure financial stability. And that was our quick run through. Of <laughs> All right. So let me do some final notes here. I'm sorry. Uh, our time is run out, but let me do some final notes here. Public comment. There has to be advertised public comment on both the proposed budget from the county, uh, from the uh, school board and the proposed county budget for the county, from the county commissioners. There has to, by law, be public comment on both of those. Sunshine laws, y'all, they just pointed out that is correct. Uh, that's a big drawback on the superintendent's plan that there was no public comment on either one of those. I just he said, I'm, I'm gonna do this. You can't, that's, that's, not, that's not allowable either. So make sure you understand. When the superintendent presents their budget to the school board, the, the school board has to make that and have public comment on that, has to provide that to, to all, parents and interested parties, just like the school budget has to be made available to all parents and interested parties. Um, that same rule with the school board budget. And then once it's approved and voted on after public comment, it goes to the county commission. They have to do the same thing again. Public comment before it's voted on. You can't just unilaterally say, I'm going to do this. Not allowed to. Either way, even if it's good, you're not allowed to do that. So that's a great point as well. Um, the follow-up to Leandro that I think Tiffany's group talked about is, is it's still being, um, that has to be updated regularly. That is called Future Ready Students for the 21st century. Uh, if you look under interviewing materials in our class shell, you will see that definition of what Future Ready Students are. Um, that's the rubric that they work off of to make sure that we're providing a sound education. It's Future, it's called Future Ready Students. So I have that document in there for us. Um, <clears throat> average daily membership, um, that is subtracted from your state money. You've got to remember that as well. That's why you have to keep up with your, with your daily attendance in your classrooms. That becomes the PMR, the principal's monthly report on attendance. Uh, schools are funded on average daily membership, not how many are enrolled. For example, in Mallory School, if she has 95% attendance this month, they only get 95% of, uh, of that $8,000. Now, average daily membership also means you don't get $8,000 for a kid at the beginning of the year. You get, at the end of the first month of school, after the first 20 days, you get 800 minus the attendance rate for that month. You get 800 per pupil. You get 10 monthly, equal monthly payments. You do not get the $8,000 up front. It comes monthly. After the first month, the school has to have operating money for the first month. After that, state reimburses at the rate of $800 per pupil, minus the percentage rate that of, of, of absenteeism or the average daily membership. So you get 95, if your attendance rate in your district is 95%, you get 95% of that $800 for that kid. Do not get the 8,000 up front, which leads to the myth about charter schools. <clears throat> Money follows kids. And so if a kid goes, if a kid comes back to you from a charter school, at the end of that month, you'll get the money. The charter school didn't get the, the whole money for that kid as well. Now you, you'll be out for a month on that kid. You, you will, it will cost you for a month. But we have this myth that kids that go to charter schools and then come back to public schools, that they got the whole $8,000 for the year. And then that, no, 
it does put a burden on us because we don't get paid. You know, we, we, we don't get the money until they've been there a month before we get the money. And it does overload our classes and creates burden. But it's a myth that the whole 8,000, where the kids started that year got the whole 8,000. No, no, nobody gets, no school gets the whole 8,000. You get 10 monthly installments called average, you know, average daily membership minus your ADM, your, 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 your number of kids that are, in, that are on average in membership every day for that month. That, that, that algorithm kicks in and you get whatever percentage of, of $800 for that kid. So these schools that scream and yell or these folks who say, well, charter schools are taking all, they get all the money and we get the kids. No, the, the money will come back at the end of the month. After they've been there a month, the money will come back to that kid. But you will be out for that month. That is true. But you'll only be out for the month. You won't be out for the year. So understand how, how money, state money comes to your school. It comes once a month, it's divided in 10 equal payments, minus your absentee rate. That's how it comes to you. And the report that, that is filed monthly is called the principal's monthly report for attendance. And that's, the, that's where they subtract the <laughs> absentee from the money that you get. And then finally tonight, a lot of this is about privilege. It's that same old. It's that same old argument. Unfortunately, is elections have consequences. The people who get in power make decisions. Um, that and they're there to maintain privilege. Um, and what stokes that that argument or that conflict is the Robin Hood effect. If 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 this child gets more, it means my child gets less because the money is not infinite. I mean, it, it's finite. There's a limit. It's not infinite. Uh, we can't just make more money. And there's other people that want it too. Police, fire, other services, mental health, community colleges, area vocational schools, they want, they want money as well. It's not like we can just add more and more and more money. There is a limit to have, there's a pot and that's, that's all we have. And if when we start doing school-based budgeting, unfortunately, we compete against ourselves. We don't, when we say well, we're going to do school-based budgeting, we're going to cut the police or the fire's budget so we can give this school. No. We look at entities. We look at the school system. We're going to give the school system $10 million. Now, if you're going to shift some of that to some students, that means we're not going to give you, we're going to spend $4 million more this year on these schools over here. These four schools are going to spend $4 million, a million, make more. No, that's got to come out of the $10 million. We don't go to the police and take $4 million from them. That's not how that works. When you get your budget from the county commissioners, if, if, if you're gonna shift money and you can, if they approve it and give it to you, you can shift that money. But if you do that in your budget to them, they may say, we're not gonna give you that. We'll subtract that amount of money from you. But even if they approve for you to do school-based or site-based budgeting, where you differentiate how much schools get per pupil, of your local money, even if they do that, you understand it's a Robin Hood. You're taking money from one school and giving it to another, one child giving it to another. And that's the blowback that you get. This case is like an octopus, it has tentacles, it's just, but if you can, if you can understand all the rules and the laws and can work through all, all of that, where the funding comes from, how it comes, what you can do with it, you can be a force for good and change in your communities because you'll be the expert and you can explain some of these things to people when they say, well, how come we aren't getting more? Well, we got to take it from somebody else. We've got to get to the county commissioners and say, you know, this is more important than that. And, and we've got to, to work with different constituencies in order to do that. And in the end, um, it's a very interesting case. It has a lot of, as I said, tentacles, but the, the, the main thing that you should learn from this is, is you need to know how the money works. You need to know how money works in the school business. And when you do, things begin to make more sense to you as well as to why things are done as they're done. Because I'm like you, I have questions about why we don't do more for the least of us, why we, why we can't find it within ourselves. But then I understand the rules and I realize that, that you know, if we, if we give the one, we have to take from the other. Uh, and that never goes well.
never goes well. Thoughts on the Leandro case as we close this out. Who's going to do the benediction tonight? Give us Somebody give us a kind of a, a closing statement here on the Leandro case. Alicia, I see you've got something on your mind. Somebody, anybody, anybody have a close for us tonight? Don't everybody talk at once. I would say, oh, oh, sorry. I would just say, don't get creative with the money. Use it for what it's intended uh, for. The more creative you try to get, the more creative you're going to be to try to find a new job. That's correct. Dr. Lamb, I was going to say that um, from a student aspect, kind of, um, how people say when when they were younger they didn't know their parents were poor till they yeah. kind of grew up and realized all the things they didn't have and it's kind of like that in school like as a student you don't realize your school doesn't have until you become a teacher and you see the school across town so it's just kind of eye-opening it is that's a good analogy that's an excellent analogy that is correct we actually did a tour of our school and like some of our teachers didn't realize the CTE programs that we have available. Right. Like we have a, a cat simulator and I um, it like prints a report out and they can actually take it to Caterpillar and our kids can get jobs um, running the loaders and stuff. And we have a welding simulator and like a lot of the teachers didn't realize that we have these opportunities for our students that they could actually use. Right. Mm -hmm. that, that there's, there's, Take advantage and maximize what you have. That's that's one of the lessons as well from Leandro is, is do the best with what you've got. Maximize what you have. Make sure everybody knows what you do have, that the federal government paid for this. Um, you know, I remember when I was a high school teacher, people would get mad at Jerry Nooner. Jerry got this, and why'd Jerry get that? You know, Jerry, we don't like Jerry. Why'd he get this? That Well, he, he was running the federal program, and, and the federal government was paying for that. and and people needed to understand it wasn't like that somebody was giving him and, and their child was doing without your child could be in that program as well and so yes know what you've got and how it's used and be able to say this is why we have that welding simulators because the federal government bought it for it it didn't cost your child anything but kevin is absolutely right um don't try to get creative follow the rules and bianca is right as well you don't know. And sometimes if you don't know you're poor, you're happy with what you've got and you do the best you can. Um, at, at the building level, just, just be a knowledgeable person and try to help your community um, and, and encourage people to vote folks in that are, are supporters of all kids and not, and, and, and not just some kids, I guess. Uh, that's, that's, that's the important thing. All right. We went over tonight, and I apologize. We'll try to be faster next week. But uh, I will see you all next Wednesday. We've got two more weeks. Hang in there. It'll be okay. I've enjoyed it tonight. You did a great job. Thank you.